appreciate you coming today, and uh, man, I thank the Lord for a non-rainy Easter day. I usually try, I'm famous for my jokes, not because they're funny, but just because I dare to say them. And so the most recent groaner moaner that I could give you is that, uh, do you know what the first musical group band was that showed up with Jesus? It was the Spice Girls, because on the first day of the week, they came and they brought these spices and, all right, that's close, right? If you've got your uh, bulletin today, I want you to do something with me. First of all, pull it out, pick it up. There's all kinds of stuff contained in this. If you'll read it, John won't have to take so long at the end. But uh, the first thing I want you to do is, it's not that you have to cross out, don't you care, because that was the message I planned to bring today, but this one is what I would like you to write in underneath it. Uh, you can go bewildered. Now, the wildebeest is what I always think of when I hear that word, so if you want to, you can put the bewildered beast. But um, what the message today is going to be about, and I'm kind of one of these that, I figure that some of the ones that come only Christmas and Easter figure there's only two messages. And it's the cross, or it's the cradle and it's the cross. And so it's not that those aren't important messages. It's just I thought maybe if some of you hear something more that you'll go, wow, I didn't know there was that much in the Bible besides the cross and the cradle. And so in doing so, it's not to take away from what's been done. And in fact, uh, this past week, there were countless hours put in of both the preparation and the writing of a script and the decorations and one thing and like that to put on this thing we called Risen. And uh, so that instead of being just a play, it was a walkthrough experience. And I want to appreciate and thank all those that were a part of that. Uh, some made costumes and, I, and then turned around and thought they had them made and had to make even more as time went on because... Some of the guys got bigger even after they'd been hemmed in, and, you know, so they had to, couldn't just let them out, they had to make whole new ones. But uh, anyway, it was a very, very cool type deal, and uh, just want to share appreciation for that. But so the, it's, the Easter story oftentimes gets muddied up with all kinds of things, and what I want you to understand is that part of the story, and the truth is that Jesus Christ did die for our sins, and he had to shed blood to pay for those sins so that the law would be answered. And that what he freed us from technically is religion. He freed us from a religion. Now, Christianity is still recognized as a world religion. It's one of the largest. It's still looked at that way. And sadly, there are a lot of Christians that feel more of the religion end of things than they do the understanding of what Jesus really came to do. Because the whole reason him coming personally here was and not just showing up, dying in two days and get, going back up or dying, just living here a couple of days, dying and then raising from the dead and going back up. That could have satisfied the law. But Jesus came down and he spent a whole lifetime, even though it was a short life, about 33 years. He spent a lifetime here in flesh, but he did it. And that's why we have the story of the cradle with the baby born in the manger. But he spent his whole life in that flesh and was limited in some of the things he could do. That although God, that he purposely allowed himself to experience life like you and I do. And the whole thing was, is because he understood that religion had tied up and imprisoned people for years. And what religion is based upon, and I oftentimes call it just the mindless monotony of motion. Things that you go through and do because that's what people that belong to this are supposed to do. Whether it's this church or this situation or that religion. This is what we do. And so often it's, well, what do I need to do? And we will begin saying, and now there are things to do, but in the acceptance of Christ, the biggest thing is to believe because without that faith, everything else that you do is worthless. There's nothing that we do here that we want to pretend that by doing it, it in and of itself is what makes us worthy. No, it's the blood of Christ. And so I'm not dissing the cross and I'm not dissing, obviously, the open tomb and the body that was not only not discovered, but it was come back to life. But what I want you to know is, is that we have this freedom from religion. And although it's not a constitutional issue at all, it's literally for everybody that's a Christian, we're so different than the rest of the world. There are even certain religions that still have the bodies of the people that started it or whatever, entombed or encased. I mean, we know from the, uh, from the Egyptian pharaohs to even some of the communistic countries whose emperors are still embalmed and people can go see. But those are all dead people. Our king rose and stayed alive and said, hey, I'm going on up to heaven and I'm going to get a place prepared for you. But now the problem, though, with this religion thing is, is we uh, once again almost become enslaved to something that Jesus Christ tried to set us free from. 
And I'm going to use Peter today and his bewilderment to help us maybe to relate. Those of us that do believe, those of you that have thought about Christianity say, I can't play the game. Those of you that have tried and feel like you failed, I hope today to kind of, I, I don't want to say convince you, but at least present things to you for your reconsideration. Around here, man, I tell people, don't check your brain at the door. We want thinkers. We're not here to talk you into anything, but I do want to show you what we have right here from the very stories in this Bible, what we can do. So let's pray. God, I pray today just that, Lord, I would get out of the way and that in the midst of the oftentimes more pomp and circumstance on Resurrection Sunday than any other, the truth is, God, that every week's alike and that uh, we can meet every week to rejoice. There still is an empty tomb. And there is a risen Savior, and that his name is Jesus. And Lord, when we receive and accept you on your terms, you've given us all kinds of promises. There are benefits and blessings to this life, but boy, they're oftentimes shrouded in uh, heartbreak, sometimes fear, uh, sometimes great, great disappointment. Sometimes it's the disappointment of what others didn't do or did unto us. But, Lord, I think one of the biggest burdens that any one of us can carry is what we have done, what we did when we didn't live up to our own standards, what we did when we feel like whether we failed you or somebody we claimed that we loved, when we failed, Lord, and haven't been perfect when we thought we could be again. And so, Lord, today I just ask that in the midst of the grappling that when we do slow down, and even on a Super Bowl Sunday, so to speak, that we would, Lord, decide which team we're on, and we'd recognize that, Lord, as we read ahead, which team wins, but that, God, that in it, that we're not supposed to just be spectators, but we're to be in the game. And whether that's in the game because we're fast, or we're great uh, at receiving, or we're powerful in blocking, God, or whether we feel like we can't do anything, that the truth is, Lord, there's not one of us that you didn't die for and not one of us that you don't want to use so that your kingdom, the church, can be seen on earth just like you see it in heaven. And the God, that um, the part that, that you really died for and came for, Lord, was so we'd have a relationship with you, not a new religion. And not just with you, but if we have it with you, that we'd have it with each other. And the divine power that you have to cross our paths together because for a purpose, that we are to leave impressions on one another. And that, Lord, we're not designed to do the solo Christianity. It's a symphony. And so, God, today in that sympathy, sym symphony, uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. In that midst of that, God, I, play, or I pray to you that I could play my part, not acting, but, God, teeming with you. And in that relationship, you overwhelming me and saying things through my mouth, Lord, more than I've prepared for everybody that's here, that each one that wants to hear something from heaven could today. Something that, Lord, they would know is so beyond Steve that uh, it had to be you, God. So that in it, Lord, today, we don't leave alone. We leave with you, and we begin to appreciate each other like you designed us to be. In the name of Christ, amen. So if you will, turn, and you got your Bibles, if you want to, it'll be on the screen as well. But in Luke chapter 5, we have this story that's kind of the beginning of Peter's relationship with a guy named Jesus. Jesus that wasn't the Christ at that time, although he was. He hadn't been recognized at that. But Jesus that was of Nazareth, a town that was considered to be less than. Um, not a town of great repute, but one of bad stories, you know, so to speak. A nothingness town, a cow town, probably more of a sheep town. But that's where Jesus was from, and his path crossed Peter, and he already had people that began to follow. And, and I was sharing with somebody this week that something that oftentimes gets forgotten is during this period of time when Jesus was on the earth, there was all kinds of things going on politically. And by that, what I'm saying is, is that there, the Jews absolutely did not like Herod, or did not like, excuse me, did not like the Pharaoh, or the, the emperor, the, the Caesar, didn't like him, didn't like the Romans, but they felt powerless. A lot of the religious leaders had lost their spirituality and become more politicians because they found that if you curry favor, it worked well for you. There's money to be gained, power to be gained. And so even though they despised Caesar and the Roman government and the Roman army, they went ahead and they kind of cozied up to it to say, well, I'm going to make the best of a bad situation. As a result of those two things, and there were uh, insurrectionists, there were people that were continually trying to overthrow not only the Roman government, but even the Jewish things. And, and so there's this turmoil going on in people. 
and what we have then is that uh, Jesus comes along and he's not just the only one claiming to be a Messiah. He's one of the many Messiahs. As what, when things are messed up, there's always somebody coming in to save the day. And as we go about into another political season, and why do they have to start it so early? We've got two years, man, before we have to vote. But as they go into all this, it try, they try to stir things up. I want you to know it's a lot like what was going on here. And so there were people that were like many of us that just want to put the blinders on, just leave me alone, let me do my own life. There were people that were hearing promises and they go, that's what I want, I want that. And they don't have any idea how it could be fulfilled, but that's what they want because that sounds good at the moment. There's other people that are against stuff over here and all this stuff was going on. And I share that with you because we get torn. And in the midst of it, a part of that, I believe, is just the devil working to try to keep our eyes off of Christ and to make us feel miserable about ourselves and angry at other people. That's the way he works. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. He came to end relationships. He didn't come to enhance them. The devil I'm talking about here. Jesus, on the other hand, came to take back what the devil had stolen. He came back to build back families and relationships with people, even crossing boundaries of, of you know, not only nationality, but a variety of things to where all people could be united, Jews as well as the Gentiles, which is everybody that's not a Jew, could be united underneath one, Jesus Christ, and that we would be unified together that way. So Jesus was just one of the many voices, and there were people who were following him, and they're listening to what he had to say, but he was not like the religious leaders, not so authoritative and everything, but it was almost more authoritative because what he said made sense. It was everyday language that they could understand, and he didn't talk down to people. He shared with them. And he would encourage them and tell them about things. But he was trying to stress about a kingdom that's out of this world, not just one that's in it. But that while we're in this world, that we could have a peace, that we could have a hope, that we could have this understanding. We could endure all things through him because he was going to give us strength to do so. And so Jesus comes sharing this message and man, people started listening. They started coming from around and they started leaving the people they'd heard, including John the Baptist was one of the ones that was also talking at that time and telling about a coming kingdom. But he was pointing to Jesus. So when his disciples left him and went, John's not offended. He's encouraged because he came to point and say, that's the one. This is it. This is the real king. Okay. And so as these people came, then they flocked around and what we read here in the beginning that says, so one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret with the people crowding around him, what were they doing? They're listening to the word of God. Now, this could mean that Jesus was using Old Testament passages, which he did. He validated stories. He talked about Moses. He talked about Jonah. There are a variety of different things that Jesus Christ quoted from the Old Testament. So he certainly would have used it. It was the only Bible there was. There was no New Testament at that time. But also because of the fact that he was God, and John later on writes of him, not John the Baptist, but John his disciple writes about him and said he was the word. And so Jesus was sharing the word of God. What he was doing was not only taking Old Testament passages, but he's sharing the word, the true thing about, let me tell you what God planned. Let me tell you what's going on here. Let me tell you about what you can have, what you can receive, who you can be. And yet the coolest part about it was Jesus never once invited somebody to come follow him because he said, I'm just going to make your life so rosy. I'm going to make your life a bowl of cherries. I'm going to make your life, you know, whipped cream and and start sprinkles, you know? I mean, he didn't promise that. He said, I'm going to, in fact, make your life, and these aren't his words, but it would be what we'd say today, a living hell. He said, whatever they do to me, they will do to you. Well, at this time, it's new, and whenever it's new and fresh, everybody loves you, loves you, loves you. So at this time, these people want to hear what he has to say, and not only are there a large, large number of people, but they actually begin crowding around because everybody wants to touch him. Everybody wants their piece of Jesus. They want to find out, is this guy really real? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? Is this the one that's going to overthrow uh, Rome, you know? And is this the one that's going to go ahead and bring back the sanity and let the people that believe in God be the ones that rule the world? And so they're crowding around. Well, as Jesus gets crowded out of it, then we read on, and he said, he saw at the water's edge uh, two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Now, this is a story I know I've talked about, preached about before. It's endearing to me because... I think it so represents where most of us are. We're just trying to get by. We want to get ahead, but at least we want to get by. Financially, um, be, have some friends we can depend on, raise our family, have kids that do everything we tell them to do, 
have parents that will let us do whatever we want to do. I mean, we all have these dreams, right, of what we want. We're doing our deal. And so these fishermen were doing their deal. This is how they made their living was fishing. Now they're washing their nets, and I'm not much of a fisherman. I like to eat it, and that's about it. So I love you guys that catch it and invite me to your house, and you cook it, and then I eat it. I really, really love fish a lot. But um, I'll even eat some of that, you know, bait that's called sushi. I mean, it's, it's pretty good when it's wrapped with the right stuff. So, but anyway, these guys are washing their nets. Why? It's part of the deal. They've been fishing, and you get everything from the seaweed and the junk on it to whatever else to catching it on rocks because they're just throwing it out and bringing it back in. And so they mend their nets. They look for places because the worst thing you can do is have a net with a big hole in it when the big one gets away. And so they're mending their nets, and they're, they're cleaning their nets. And then the next thing they would do is they would lay them out on the rocks hopefully when it wasn't raining, to dry their nets so that that night when they got together that they would fold them then and so that they would unfurl or unfold in a way that would make it easiest to, once again, throw them out, drag them in, catch the fish, throw them out, drag them in. It's not a pole. It wasn't, you know, fishing from the shoreline. They were out in their boats trying to basically net these fish and bring them in, so that's how they made their living. So this deal with Jesus going on, they're doing their deal, I'm sure listening and kind of looking and going, but they're still doing their deal. And in the midst of them doing their deal, Jesus cries out to them, or doesn't cry out, he just goes over, he says to them, he said, uh, he got into one of their boats, so they're over there doing their nets, and he got in one of the boats and said, hey, whose boat is this? I want you to, uh, and can you crank me out a little bit? Now, if he is from Georgia, he'd say, I'm fixing to talk, but I'm getting so crowded by these people, they can't hear me, so I need you to be fixing to get your boat over here to the side. Anyway, so he asked them, and it was Peter's, and did Jesus know that ahead of time? I'm guessing so, but maybe not. It's like we get into situations, and we, sometimes we know, and sometimes we don't know. And as I mentioned last week, Jesus had this ability, God could give him insight to anything, even like he can to us, if we're willing to be used of him. And not to do it for pride, not to do it so we impress people, but rather instead to serve people. But he, I think, very purposely picked Peter's boat and he said, hey, can you row me out a little bit? And in fact, what he said here was, he said, uh, put out into deep water and let down, the, or before he did that, he asked him, he got into the boat and he said, crank me out a little from shore. So he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. Verse 4, when he finished speaking, and we don't know how long Jesus talked, I, of course, believe it's much longer than I do. But uh, he put into the deep water, and he said, he said, put out, excuse me, go out deeper out here, go out further, and put down the deep water, let down the nets for a catch. And Simon replied very logically, and I'm sure was really tempering himself, not to say any bad words in front of Jesus, uh, but, you know, he's frustrated, and he's about to tell why. He said, Master, so he's kind to him, respectful. We've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. I completely relate. Um, we talked before in guys' group about one of the things that we have to be really careful about is with our wives. When you're busy and you get interrupted, it's kind of a nuisance. In our minds, not, of course, to our lovely wives, but in our minds, it's a nuisance. And then when we're frustrated and focused and busy, it's flat-out fighting words, right? I mean, it's like, what do you want? You know? Sorry, I didn't mean to wake anybody up today. I so let you sleep peacefully. Some people, this is the only place of rest they can come to. But, but you know, we, we react to things. And Jesus is now, you know, telling this guy. And Peter's like, you don't have a clue what all we've been going through. And you're pushing this. And I already let you use my boat. But now you're wanting my freshly pressed nets cleaned and ready for tonight. Because I need to get home and get some sleep. Because we're going to go fishing tomorrow night. Because we've got to do twice as much. Because last night we didn't get a thing. And he's saying... And you may not know it, but this isn't the time you fish for, or you fish for fish on the surface. It's the wrong time for that. Besides, you've been out here rocking and rolling and talking to these people. You probably scared the fish all away. But he said, since it's you, I'll do it. Because you say so, I will. That's a great line to keep in your mind. It's, it's one of the best things you can ever tell God. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't feel like it, but because you say so, I will. And I'm talking about because, you see, it is a relationship. And this is where it's not religion. It's not, here, go find this passage and read what you're supposed to do. It's, 
God wants to be personal with you, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ want to speak to us, and they will call us to do things that don't make sense, that don't fit within our time frame, that, that right now are flat out frustrating. And besides, God, if you'd help me with this, I, I don't mind doing it, but I, I could use some help here. And you're asking me to do something totally different. Ever felt that? And Peter's there, but he said, I surrender. All right. As you say, so I will. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break, signaled the partners in the other boat. I think the they there was Jesus and Peter. I think he got right in there with them and um, signaled the other partners, said, come on, man, we got too many. And um, they went out and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And so you can imagine a boat that's this far, you know, the, the water's up to this and splashing over the edge at times because they're just trying to go slow enough to get these fish into shore and not lose one of them. But instead of getting there and counting the fish and all this, verse 8 we read, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Why would he say that? He obeyed God. It was because inside he suddenly realized whose presence he was in. He called him master, but man, he didn't know how much of a master he was. The people, I don't know how many of them were still paying attention because the sermon was over. Maybe they'd gone, maybe they're milling around, maybe they'd left. But man, he had Peter's attention and James and John and these others. He had their attention because that just doesn't happen accidentally, normally, in the average situation. And so Peter's reaction is, I'm in the presence of divinity. You are God. And when you're in the presence of God and you are real with yourself and him, you know that what really begins to shine out of his glory is it shines upon our ugliness, our darkness, our sin. Because we got a sin problem. But it's not just a problem, and it's not anything that anybody doesn't have that's old enough. It's all of us do. We can pretend we don't, but we do. Even when we think we aren't, we're just hiding it because we do. And and, and I want you to, to grasp that. And it's not because I want to make you feel bad today. I want to tighten the screws up on your conscience. No, no, no. It's not that at all. It's just I want you to be real about yourself. And I want you to be real in the presence of God. Because some of you have been self-defeating. Some of you have gone ahead and alienated yourself from Christ because you aren't good enough. There's none of us that are good enough. But he didn't come Starry-eyed, believing that, man, if I just give you all a little bit of a shining and erase all your marks, it, you know, you're going to be good. He didn't believe that. And that's the part that I'm saying is it's the relationship. Religion doesn't have room for errors. Relationship understands. Stupid people believe that they can say, honey, I love you, honey, I love you, and I can't say anything wrong with you. And four years later, you can't say anything right with them, and you're ready to give it up. But if there's a relationship there... Not only do you not expect, because you know you're not perfect, so why would you expect them to be perfect? But on top of that, love conquers the difference, right? In a relationship, a true relationship, love conquers. Jesus brought it to the point that he said, not only we should, but we could love our neighbors. What's that mean? It means that we can even choose to, with people that we don't have much of a relationship with, we can choose to make it a deeper relationship. We can choose to accept them faults and all. And we don't have to poke our finger in the holes unless it's to plug up someplace that's bleeding. We can accept them. We can love them. And the whole idea was that Jesus knew because if they see you doing that, they're going to go, where do you get this from? Normal people don't love this way. It's one of the reasons the sign of the fish became the sign of the fish. And it's talked about, and I don't know anything because it doesn't say biblically anything about it, but that one of the things they did when persecution was heavy is that they would take their walking sticks and they would draw the sign of the fish. And that would say, I'm a believer, what about you? And if you weren't, you just see a fish and go, well, I can draw better than that. But if you were, then it was like, okay, and you'd have something in common. Well, the Lord wants this relationship with us, but it's just like with Peter. He didn't accidentally pick Peter. He didn't pick Peter because Peter was perfect. And I'm going to quit right there because I'm going to get into tongue-tied or somewhere. But um, he picked Peter knowing what he was. But he also knew his potential, just like he does all of us. He knows not only everything that we've done, 
because he was God, he died for all of our sins, which means all the sins you and I haven't even committed yet, he still died for. Now, one of the things that I, if you're like me, that it's difficult for me, I never ever want to take my sin for granted or his grace. And it bothers me when there are people that are very flippant about it in the sense of right in the midst of sin, they go, oh, well, I'll just ask for forgiveness. That bothers me because that's not respectful. And, and I, I think it just cheapens it. But I don't believe for one moment that there's not a sin that's covered for. It's just that in a relationship, I mean, whether it's me with you or me with Julie, if, if I screw up and mess up and go, you know, oh, well, you'll forgive me, right? How's that make you feel? So if it's a relationship, let's at least be with Jesus respectful and loving and kind and, and you know, sorrowful, right? And that's why the Bible talks so much about repentance. It's not something you do once. It's a regular part of our life with Christ and really should be with each other because we still continue to what? Screw up. We sin. So I want you to see this picture, and then I don't have time to go into all the others, but... If I can just at least tell you where they're at and hit on them here real quickly, I will, because Peter became then this guy that, you know, fell on his knees. And, oh, if you didn't read it, the rest of the story was he not only fell on his knees and said, get away from me, I'm a sinful man, but Jesus said, got shoved that out of the way and said, man, I want you, come follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men, which literally means I'm going to help you catch people alive. And um, in doing so, Peter then, it said, left everything, and so did his partners, ironically. The biggest catch of their life, they left on the beach for people just to take. Even though they were frustrated and didn't know how they were going to make the next payment on their boat, let alone feed their kids, they left it all because they believed that much that Jesus was worth following. And so what we see from there, and most of us know, and what's ironic is I think every time in your New Testament, whenever the 12 disciples are talked about, the 12 apostles, who's always the first one? Peter. Peter's always mentioned first. You ask somebody a question or trivia or whatever like that, name three of the 12 apostles. Well, a lot of people will remember Judas because, well, he was Judas, but, but they'll absolutely remember Peter, James, and John because they're the first three they're always talking about. They got to do special assignments with Jesus that the other nine got left out of. I mention that because I want you to see that Peter suddenly went from just this fisherman into where with this one experience, he believed that this was the coming one. This was the promised one. This guy is going to be the one that's going to make everything right. He's the politician. Peter's putting all his money on. He left it all to follow him. And and I share that with you because I think it's vital to see. And Peter then, we begin to look at his personality, and it's kind of almost a natural, it would seem, for Jesus to use somebody like that because Peter was, at the very least, any of you that have ever read the stories about him, but he was bold. Wasn't very bashful, right? He was bold. He um, would speak up about everything, give you even sometimes speak before he thought, and it got him into trouble. Peter would, um, you know, j- just it was like anything Jesus wanted to do, I'll be the first, let's go. And so I'm going to hit on just a few of these things, if you will, and you got your Bibles and you want to, if you want to just write down your notes there, because I, I want you to be able to look to make sure that what I'm telling you is biblical and not just something that I'm saying, okay? But in chapter 14 of the book of Matthew, we find this story about Jesus goes ahead and he feeds these 5,000 people, which is amazing. And they had left over because they started with barely anything. And we go from there to where it says in Matthew 14, 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went on a mountainside uh, by himself to pray. So Jesus said, guys, you go on across, get in the boat and go. I'm going to go up here. I need some quiet time with God. So he's praying up there when Evening came, he was there alone, verse 24, but the boat was already a considerable uh, distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake, the water of the lake. Not walking around the lake, not uh, Lake Altoona, where sometimes it's so thick you can walk on it, but no, it was really just on the absolute water. He's walking on the lake. They are straining at the oar, trying to get to the other shore. And they see him walking, but they don't even realize it's necessarily him. They're terrified, it says, and they cry out. And this is the funniest thing to me. One of the funniest things in the Bible is because they cry out and go, and these are grown men. 
there's a ghost, <laughs> you know. And uh, it wasn't Casper or anything that way. Nope, it was Jesus. They cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And I find that so cool, and he says that so often, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And that's a part of the relationship. As humans, we struggle to be spiritual, and that's why we cuddle up towards religion, because we can handle that, and we can think through it, we can fit within its mold sometimes, or at least fake it. But with the relationship, it's different than that. There are things that God's going to allow us to go through present before us or things that people will do to us that the immediate reaction we're going to have is fear and he's saying stop i'm still here you didn't know i was close by and sometimes it's a little creepy when jesus is so close even when we're sinning but he says don't be afraid and so peter of all the disciples that are out there in that boat said well lord if it's you then Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, all right, Peter, come on, big boy, come on. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And what did Jesus tell him? Don't be afraid. But all of a sudden, fear comes back in. And I'm hoping that any of you that struggle with fear, you know you're in good company. I'm not saying, so it's okay to keep fearing. I'm just saying many of us do, but overcome it. Because Peter was doing just fine until he started thinking. And when he thought about what he was doing, he saw how big the wind and the waves were. Then it was like, oh, oh, and he quit thinking about who he was walking to, who told him to come. Jesus then said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And I don't know that he said that to Peter so much as he said it to the other 11 that were still over there going, I'm sticking in the boat, man. He was the only one that got out. And from there, you can go on and just keep reading through the Gospels here and seeing Peter involved. And in chapter 16, Jesus even asked a question there, and he brings up and says, well, who do people say that I am? And then after he said that, he said, now, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter was the first one to speak up. In fact, the only one we have record of speaking up said, I believe you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, man, Peter, that's so cool because our flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father let you know. And I'm just impressed that you said that. And so then Peter thought, okay, I've got this down now. I'm really becoming a heavy hitter in this, this following of Jesus deal, man. I mean, I must be number one on the list. And so Jesus starts explaining about this whole death, burial, and resurrection. And Peter goes, no, Lord, they'll never do that to you. And do you all remember, or have you read in chapter 16 here what it says that Jesus said to him? Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of men. Now, that's a gut kick to Peter, and he steps back, and, but he's beginning to realize, and how is this kingdom of yours going to work? And from there, you can go on. He got included with the transfiguration, and was up there on this Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah and Jesus in the middle of them, and they're talking, and Peter and James and John were sleeping and kind of at least nodding off, and suddenly they come to awareness, well, Peter's the only one that spoke up and like a dummy instead of just listening to see, because I... I would like to think, but I'd probably be more like Peter, I would like to think that I would have gone ahead and said, dang, you don't see that every day, Moses and Elijah and Jesus. When they get done talking, I got some questions I want to ask Moses about, you know. I'd really like to get, pick on Elijah's brain and ask him, why did you run from the very lady that, you know, you, you despised? Because he ran from, like he was scared, from this wicked Jezebel. And uh, anybody, Jezebel's here today. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be speaking about you, but he ran from her and told God, he said, just, just let me die. And if I'd have been God, I said, well, Jezebel's ready to do it. You don't, you're not really serious about dying or you just stayed there. But my point being is, is Peter speaks up and he interrupts whatever they're talking about and said, hey, I've got this great idea. Let me build three shelters, one for each of you, and we'll just stay on this mountaintop experience. Poof, the other two are gone. It's just Jesus with them. Then the father speaks out of this cloud, and he said, this is my son, listen to him. So Peter had a listening problem, is what I oftentimes can as well. That's why I decided as a little boy when I was six that I would go ahead and be a preacher instead of sitting in the seat, because I'd rather talk at people than to have to listen. But, uh, you know, and so any of you that want to preach, just let me know, and we'll go ahead and try to find you a church. But um, I'm being a little facetious there. But, but, but anyway, Peter had this talking problem. And we just see continual things. And from there, I mean, I could go on. 
Because it, it's just this thing that Peter, like I said, bold and unabashed and just ready to jump in on everything, which is really cool. And that's the kind of guy you like to hang out with. But, but then at this thing, this last supper, this last time of eating with Jesus, Jesus knows that they don't get it yet. But he knows the time has come, and he says, one of you going to betray me. You can read about it in all the Gospels, someplace along the line, but, but Luke shows quite a bit about it as well, and, and uh, so does Matthew, but Luke 22, if you want to, you can at least mark that and go back and read it. If you didn't especially get to go through Risen and see the Lord's Supper somewhat try to be portrayed of what would have taken place here. And it was in the midst of this supper that there were several things that happened. John 13 says that these guys were all about themselves and even talking and discussing that 24 hours before Jesus is going to be dead, they're talking about and discussing about which one do you think is the greatest? These are grown men, but they're acting like little boys, aren't they? Which one's going to be the greatest? And Jesus then kind of stops that conversation by taking off his robe and he just grabs a towel and a basin and he goes around and starts washing their feet. Whoa. Peter says, no, Lord, not me. That's, that's not right. I should do you, not you doing me. And Jesus said, Peter, let me do this. Well, if you're going to do it, then do my head and my hands as well. And again, this is this guy that's just impetuous, so to speak. I mean, he just continually is speaking up. And, and so then what really caught him off guard, because going from this to where Jesus says, somebody will betray me, and he gets down to the point, and he said, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat, Peter. But I, I want to read to you what he said here in 22. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan, which was his name before Jesus. Peter was the nickname Jesus gave him, Rocky, so to speak, is the way we'd say it. But he said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you, Simon. He said, I'm talking directly to you. I prayed for you. But what did he pray? That your faith may not fail when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. And that's when Peter defiantly said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and even to death. And that's when Jesus said, but Peter, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. I'd love to go on into all this story, and many of you have heard it, if not most all of you have heard it, but I want to get to this other part because from that moment on, things are different with Peter. He does, in fact, show his boldness. He does, in fact, he's the one that pulled out his sword. And Jesus had told him, if you got a sword, go buy it because it's going to get bad. He pulls it out. He slices at this one guy, takes his ear off, and Jesus turns around and blows him away by touching that ear and putting it right back on. And he said, put your sword away. Well, this is kind of a gut kick to Peter because we get to running headlong. How many of you, when you first accepted Christ, believe, I am going to be, and I'm not out to be the best Christian, but I'm going to be one of the best Christians there ever was because, Lord, I am so sincere. I mean this with all my heart. I devote myself to you. God, thank you for this new life, cleansing me from my sins and everything. And then what happened with your gut kick? What was it got you first? I remember for me as a young kid, it was the lie I told. And as I spoke it, I thought, blew it already. I'm not perfect anymore. I wish that was the worst sin that I committed. But it, it got better in the devil's view. Um, as I said in my prayer earlier today, I'm not a Christian because of what Jesus did for me back then. I'm a Christian because I still need a Savior and what he's doing for me right now. Amen. But I want you to know that the devil wants us to believe that somehow or another we're going to be perfect. We are in the eyes of God through the blood of Christ, but, but be careful. And again, it's like I said, with any relationship, it doesn't mean, though, we take it for granted. It doesn't mean that we sin willfully and just like no big deal just okay forgive me again you know i'd say my now i lay me's when i go just in case i die tonight you know no it's a relationship but what's difficult in a relationship is when you know you've really 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 hurt somebody when you didn't fulfill or you made a promise that you didn't keep or whatever what do you do but is it anything worse than making that promise to jesus and you and I can make promises to Jesus, but Peter had lived with him for these three years. He'd been with him in everything. And, and to hear him say that you're going to deny me, no way. And, and yet when Jesus put that ear back on, Peter's like, what the crud? I told you I'd go to the death for you. 
And so that was the first thing that knocked him back. And I think that that was what caused him because one of the things that we mess up with is we keep walking after we've been hit. And I'm not saying you ought to quit. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying I don't think Peter wrestled this down and remembered the words that Jesus said over and over and over and over and over again. Don't be afraid. One of the things that Peter wasn't afraid of were these guards, these Roman guards, because he knew with Jesus he could, didn't make any difference. It's one on a hundred. He could handle it. But what he wasn't ready for was this other battle that went on within his mind. And he began to doubt himself and he couldn't figure out what Jesus, why he did. And it was because he hadn't listened closely to what Jesus had already told him was going to happen. He's still imagining an earthly kingdom and you can't have an earthly kingdom with a dead king. So Peter, in the midst of this, this begins, and then now in this being bewildered, he follows Jesus into the courtyard, and the Gospels tell about this, but we know that he ended up denying him how many times? Three. Uh, people that recognize him heard his accent. And he even cursed to make sure that they knew nobody that followed Jesus would talk like that, but... Then when he did in the rooster crowed, you can read that uh, one of the gospel writers tells about the fact that when he heard the rooster crow, Peter wept bitterly. He ran out and wept bitterly. I hope you've had some of those cries. Not because they're fun and not because it's good for us, even though I believe there's a part of it that's good. I believe tears cleanse what nothing else can touch. I believe it's healthy when we realize that we've failed and we admit it. I think that it's also, though, devastating when you don't live up to your own standards. And that's where Peter's finding himself. But first of all, he didn't remember, don't be afraid. And second of all, he didn't remember, I've prayed for you, Peter. He didn't correlate the two. And see, when we lose track of what Jesus said because of what we're thinking or we think Jesus wanted or meant, we detach ourselves from the faith that we should have and our faith becomes something that's my faith in me and my faithlessness to even myself and to others. Weeping bitterly is never fun, but, but I'm telling you, there's times that we need to recognize I did the very thing that I swore I would never do. And in it, not only did we let ourselves down, but we let others down. In John 21, and, and as you turned it, I want you to kind of go through a little bit of the scenario. So Jesus, Peter denies him. He goes out and weeps bitterly. We're not told much at all about what happened then during the crucifixion with Peter. He's not saying anything. Jesus talked to John and said, take care of my mom. I don't know whether Peter was to be found or hiding out. I don't know. If there was one person that was thrilled that it was dark, dark, dark for three hours while Jesus was on that cross, it was Peter because that's where nobody could see him. During this time, he's wrestling, but he's spiraling. And um, he's wrestling with his failure, but he, he doesn't even realize that, no, this is the time that faith really counts. And that's what Jesus said, I've prayed for you. When you've failed, return to your brothers and strengthen them. But he prayed that his faith would still be there. And Peter's about to let go of his faith because he would built his faith on this religion about how, what he could do and how he was doing it. And he was being a good soldier of Christ. And now he blew it. And what do you do? And that's the whole thing that sucks about religion is. But the relationship says you come back and you say, I'm sorry. You don't, you don't discard yourself. You believe that this guy loved you that much. And I think it's still what's wrong and missing today in many churches is this understanding of the, how much Christ loved us and that he didn't expect us to be perfect, but he also doesn't expect us and doesn't accept us in the way that you just keep on doing whatever you want because you're my favorite. It's not that kind of love. That's a sick love. He's got a righteous love that he knows our potential and he wants to pull us into it. He knew Peter's that day that he gave him the fish. 
And so in John 21, Peter's still recoiling. You don't see anything. When Jesus showed up in their midst, Peter was there with them, but he's real quiet. When the gals took him to the tomb, he was there, but he said nothing. He didn't say anything. Jesus shows up, Thomas questions, but Peter says nothing. That's not Peter. Why? He's bewildered. He's failed. He knows the depth of his failure. He feels like these people around him probably are looking at him and going, you denied him. What's the difference between you and Judas? You denied him. But the difference was Peter had listened and did really believe, and he meant what he had said. And even though he had failed, he was now struggling with, what do I do next? And Jesus had to come along in John 21, another fishing story, same lake. They went out that night and fished. So the first thing that we read Peter saying anything about after his be- denial of Christ, the first thing in however many weeks it was that we find him saying is, I'm going to go fish. Anybody want to go along? Where did Jesus first meet him? Fishing. The same sea the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Genesaret, same boat, or same body of water, just different name. And they went out that night and they fished. And how much did they catch? Nothing. Frustrating? You'd think so. And some guy on shore hollers out, "Hey, how many fish you got?" And I still say that there's bad words that they couldn't print in the Bible that, because the fishermen I know would not say, "Nope, didn't catch them, but we're doing just fine." <laughs> You just <laughs> and uh, then Peter and John look at each other and realize, and it hits, it's the Lord. And this time Peter does something. He takes his coat that he'd taken off and puts it on and jumps in the water, which shows that he was a little bit bewildered. He swims to shore, and he gets there, and Jesus is there. He goes and gets some fish, but Jesus already got fish cooking. He's made breakfast for him him and the boys and they eat some breakfast and then he gets Peter and he goes with him and he said Peter do you love me Peter swears with everything he's got that he does and he goes beyond the agape love I love you like a brother I love you like a friend I love you with all the passion that I've had Jesus said if you love me then feed my sheep he does it three times take care of my lambs feed my sheep Some people have said once for each denial. Maybe. I think it was because Jesus, and it's the way that he looked at him, the way that he said it, because he's not trying to push him down. It's the same picture of Jesus that Peter saw through the water with the moonlight or whatever was going on when Jesus is reaching down and pulling him back up from the water that he had walked on. He's putting him back up on top of it again. Jesus is reaching down to Peter. He said, Do you love me? Then trust me. I'm the Lord. I knew what you were going to do. I told you, strengthen your faith. Help your brothers. Now, this is where this relationship comes full circle because you see, it's not just a relationship with God and Jesus, but it's a relationship with each other. Peter hadn't been able to get because I don't think he'd opened up. I don't think he was anything, but so ashamed that he was afraid to tell anybody, but they tried to, and they didn't exclude him, but he wouldn't be included. He could be there and not be there. How many of you have believed that you don't need church? I don't need church to be a Christian. Tell God, because I'd like you to show me the passage in here that says that. But what the one thing I will tell you is this, and I'm not saying you can't be saved and all that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying but you'll never be the Christian God designed you to be without one another. Two reasons. One, you bring gifts and abilities and a personality to the table. Two, along with it then, God gives spiritual gifts above and beyond what your own talents and abilities are through others for you because we also come with our weaknesses. But it's not just that. It's so that when we go through things and we're afraid, we have somebody on either side of us saying, don't be afraid. Not scolding, but compelling, compassionate. Don't be afraid. Remember, the Lord said there would be days like this. It doesn't make trivial or minimize anything, but rather instead, it's that support. But in a relationship, you allow people that love you to love you. 
But too many of us, we just want to go it solo. And I'm with you because my, my thing is, I just want to be alone. I don't want to have to depend on me. I don't like anticipating. I told you, I mean, I don't expect much, so I'm not disappointed. And God has shown me things then that didn't disappoint. But I became disappointed that I had excluded and tried to have what is very much prideful thing of I'll just do it on my own. And the older I get, the more I realize how much I need the people that are around me. How important family is. How important my wife is. How important my leadership at this church is. How important each of you are. And I haven't lost my mom and my dad or any of my brothers and sisters yet. But I know you'll be there when I do. And it's not just in those moments. But it's in my moments of failure. That somebody needs to get me back up on the horse again. And not pretending. Not, not wounded. But healed. And God uses people. His church. It's a relationship. It's us that belong to Christ that know this isn't heaven, right? Life here isn't fair according to the flesh. Heaven's coming. Jesus said, never will I leave you or forsake you. So this is something I can go through. And as Cale comes up with the team, I'm going to read to you two passages. And I'm sorry I went way long. I told, I said, man, this week, Easter, I'm going to give you a lollipop. You get out early, but Somebody beat you to the egg, so you'll have to be a few less in your basket, you know? But listen from the backside of what Peter later on writes. Man, some people are just getting up and leaving. All right. <laughs> Told you I wouldn't be disappointed. Praise be to the God. This is Peter writing, okay, to the church, to his other, the relationship that came through the blood of Christ. He says, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he's also then brought us into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. Peter's writing this. Peter the failure. Peter the denier. He's writing this because he comes back strong, man. And he said... Uh, because it's for you, you who are through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So we've tasted salvation. The completeness of salvation will come when Jesus Christ comes a second time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while. Now listen to this. He said, you what? Rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire may be proved genuine and result in the praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your salvation, the goal of your faith, excuse me, the salvation of your soul. So what's Peter write about? He writes to others and says, man, don't be like me and don't miss out on all that God's got planned for you because you screwed up. But rather instead, strengthen your brothers around you. In chapter one of his second letter, he said, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us a very great and precious promises so that through them, we can participate in the divine nature and at the same time escape the the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. So the next verse he says, so for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To add to your faith. Because he goes on down to say, because if you keep these in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective or ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of him. So today, if you know you failed or you know that, man, I had every intention of being the best Christian there ever was, and if God has ever bewildered you because you thought that he would keep you strong and never let you face anything that would hurt, then come to him. There's a relationship. Come and say, Lord, you hurt my feelings. You hurt this. You hurt that. But I still believe. Because what Peter had to do was going on from believing in himself 
and just in Jesus to believing in the saving power of Christ and his grace. That's what faith rests on. But you know what's great? Even though we don't perform to get salvation, when we have that depth of faith, you can't hide it. Your love for others will reveal that you are a follower of Christ. But if nobody ever accuses you of being a lover of God and a lover of people, you may need to tweak your relationship with Christ so that your relationship with others increases as well. We have this song, and during it, you can listen, you can sing, you can sit, you can stand, you can come up, you can pray. You can grab somebody else and say, I want to pray for you. Or ask them and say, will you pray with me?